G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. As we get a little bit closer to the 2024 draft, I wanted to take a team-focused look at Richmond. Naturally, Richmond, because they hold one of the best draft hands we've ever seen, really. I mean, there's been a number of times where teams have had great hands. You know, you've got North Melbourne had five first-round picks last year. You've got the expansion clubs. Melbourne in the early 20-teens had some pretty insane draft hauls. But Richmond is a very interesting modern case study of a team who holds an enormous amount of draft picks in one single draft. And thankfully for them, it's considered a pretty damn strong draft. They're also at the bottom end of the rebuild, you'd think. And in some ways, they're a bit of a blank canvas. So in today's video, I wanted to take stock of exactly where Richmond are from an outsider looking in. Have a quick look at what their needs are. Naturally, like I said, it's a little bit of a blank canvas, but that's not necessarily going to be true across the board. So I wanted to have a look at what is their depth like in each position, in particular, looking at key position players and their midfield in general, and then talk a little bit about strategy of how they could go about doing things in the 2024 draft. I previously said, I'm not sure if they take all eight picks. Do they trade some into the future? Do they go to the draft for six? Do they trade up? We're gonna unpack all of that. So the first thing I wanted to do was take a look at their best 23. And uh, I've put this together this morning. I'm joking. I completely ripped this off the Fox footy Instagram, um, but they've given me a good template of what their best 22 could look like. And I won't lie, it is a little bit stronger than I perhaps thought. You know, when you, when you see all these players leaving Baker, Graham, Rioli, Bolton, Dusty, Pickett, uh, Grimes retired as well. For a team that already finished last, you start to think, oh dear. But we bear in mind, they did have a lot of injuries this year, and that best 22 or 23 that they've put there has got some reasonable balance and some reasonable experience. So down back, I mean, it's, they've gone with a fairly tall back line there. Tom Brown looks like a very likely type, but you've got some proven absolute guns in there. I think Ben Miller looks like a likely type. Obviously, with Josh Gibkus, I think he's tremendously talented, but he's just had the worst injury luck. So hopefully, he gets on the park this year. The midfield is spearheaded by guys like Taranto, Hopper, and Prestia. To different extents, these guys just didn't get on the park this year. I mean, Taranto, I think, played 15 games. I double-checked that, and Hopper paid, played about 12. That is a fair amount of footy to miss for a team that, going into this year, I didn't think had a lot of depth in that position anyway. But, you know, in an ideal world if you get 20 plus games out of Prestia, Hopper and Taranto that does provide a fair bit of protection for the guys coming through. However we're just talking about the strength of the best 22 and, and it doesn't have that you know top end punch but I think Richmond's pragmatic about this particular group of players not winning a premiership at the moment. Forward line's interesting as well. We know Tom Lynch has barely got in the park really as well um, and towards the end of his career, but they've got Noah Bolter picked as a forward here. I like that when you consider Ben Miller, Gibkus, Jacob Blight, guys like Broad and Vlostruin as well that play a little bit taller than their height. Shoveling Noah Bolter into the back line just doesn't make sense and I do think it makes way more sense to have him as a forward where I think he's played some good footy. Lafau shows some really good signs, I thought, from what we saw. He did an ACL, if I'm not mistaken, which I don't know if he'll be available for round one. Let me know in the comments. I'm going to assume not because I feel like he did it mid-season. You've got some smaller types in Seth Campbell, Mansell and Riley. Now all these guys have shown flashes and are fairly unheralded. That's all well and good looking at the best 22. You know, if, if they can maintain a good injury run, it will potentially foster a decent environment where they can have a competitive team to develop some of the guys they're going to draft this year. But I also want to get into some of their depth. The reason I want to do this is to, to try to inform my own thinking as well of, you know, what types of players they're going to draft in this year's draft. I can imagine they're going to go midfield pretty early um, but at what point do they start prioritizing tours how many tours do they take do they take a forward and a defender well this will help inform the thinking in my opinion so in terms of the players not selected in that 23 I've gone through each of the key positions as well as the midfield and someone like a Tyler Young I think is the only key defender not in that 22 bearing in mind they kind of picked four with Miller Broad if you consider him one Gibkus and Blight selected in that 23 I'd imagine when this team actually fills out with all their draft picks one of those will drop out and they won't pick four. That team that was selected didn't have a lot of midfield rotations, but Tyler Young at 26 has played 28 games at AFL level and had some good games, but far from a proven thing. So I guess so far, there is some degree of a need of a talented key defender. What about key forwards? Well, they did pick Bolter and Lynch as their key forwards. Lafau, do we, do we consider him one? Um, there's Jacob Bauer, who I think is undersized, but again, probably not a true key position player. So outside of that, you've got Jacob Kaczynski at 196 centimeters. He's played 62 games at AFL level. I think he played half a year this year and kicked about a goal a game. And look, I don't want to write him off, but I, I would say that they probably think they can improve on Kaczynski. But again, I've, I've seen players get to this mark, particularly key position players, 60 games, 24 years of age, and then turn into a different player. And he did have some good games at Hawthorne. So I'm not writing him off, but I, I think between him and, and Liam Fawcett, who's 
19, 197 centimeters. It was taken, I think, in the 40s last draft. I'm not going to pretend I know a whole heap about him, but there is at least one young prospect there and at a good height at 197 centimeters. So maybe a key forward isn't a desperate need in this year's draft, but I think if one presents at the right value, I don't think they're overstocked, that's for sure. Bearing in mind as well, the 2025 draft supposedly has some good, tall, genuine key position forwards. The Ruck one is interesting here as well. So they've got Nankervis and I suppose Ben Miller. I mean, Ben Miller, I think, was drafted as a Ruckman from memory out of Western Australia, but doesn't do a lot of Rucking these days. I think we can sort of conclude he's probably more a key defender at this point. But outside the 23 that was selected there, you've got Samson Ryan who's a forward Ruck, 206 centimetres, and a bloke called Oliver Hayes-Brown, who I am not familiar with at all. He is 208 centimetres, a basketball convert, and 24 years of age. So I do like the fact that he's not 18. How ready he is to play at AFL level, I'm not sure. We do know that they signed Sam Naismith at the start of last year, I think it was, and uh, he's, I think he did another ACL and retired. So in conclusion, I think Richmond probably need at least one more ruck on the list, whether it be a developing prospect or a mature state league player. Now, I'm not necessarily campaigning that they take a ruck with one of their first you know, 24 picks in the draft. There is a bloke called Alex Dodson who could be around that range. And, you know, from a needs point of view, maybe. It might not be the priority that I would make for Richmond here. I'd probably look at state league talent. We'll get to that a little bit later anyway. As for the midfield, so we know that Hopper, Taranto, Prestia, Sonzi, Ralph Smith, Ross and Banks were picked in that team. All of those guys are either genuine midfielders or wingmen or defenders as well. From memory, at least, Sam Banks was drafted as a defender and Ralph Smith has played a little bit in the back line, even though he's selected on a wing. Correct me if I'm wrong there. But outside of that 22, looking at midfielders, I mean, Camden McIntosh is a wingman who is, uh, you know, I think he's contracted for one more year at Richmond. 30 years old anyway. Kane McAuliffe showed a bit. I think he played nine games in his first season, taken with, I want to say, pick 40 in the 2023 draft. So that's a good start. But further to that, you just got Thompson Dow, a 23-year-old who's played 32 games. So if we didn't already know, we can conclude that Richmond probably do need some bolstering in the midfield, and thankfully this is a good draft to do it. What retirements have they got on the horizon? Well, Nathan Broad just re-signed, I think, for two years, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think he's out of contract next year. However, Dion Prestia and Tom Lynch are. So I'd imagine we can assume that maybe both go. I don't actually know. But if they don't retire next year, they'll retire the year after. So some degree of ready-made replacement will be required for those guys. Not sure about Camden McIntosh either. I, I think he's out of contract at the end of the year. And, you know, a fair bit less important, I would have thought, than Prestia and Lynch. But nonetheless, he is out of contract and over the age of 30. All right, so that's a bit of a map out of, of where they sit. So I think they probably need a little bit in each position. I think we can assume that they will take at least two midfielders with their first two picks. I'm going to take an educated guess. I mean, I can't see the, there being any possibility that a key position player goes pick one for a start. But then, you know, we'll get to this question of whether they trade up for pick two. But if they don't hold pick two and they say hold pick six, I still think it's more than likely that that will be a midfielder. Now, I think they're in a great position to take at least one key forward and one key back in this year's draft. I think particularly key forwards, there's a fair bit of them going, but perhaps later in the draft. I don't think they desperately need to take a, you know, someone like an Alex Toru, who'd probably be one of the only key position contenders at pick six, other than maybe Harry Armstrong. But I think for where Richmond's at, whether it's pick two or whether it's pick six, I would prioritize someone like a Harvey Langford, a Jagger Smith, a Finn O'Sullivan, over taking a bit of a gamble on someone like Alex Toru. So in conclusion, whatever Richmond's first two picks are, unless something crazy happens, I think two midfielders are going to be on the agenda. They do hold a number of picks, you know, between 18 to 24. I think there's four picks at they hold and, and as far as I see it like looking at rankings and doing some mock drafts as well that portion of the draft will still have a number of good tall forwards available so would you bother going say Harry Armstrong at pick six I mean he could be there at 10 but if, whether it's six or 10 if they hold those picks you know I think they can probably prioritize midfielders in those positions and therefore hold their later picks to pick up talls and I do think one key forward preferably like a real 200 centimeter one and one key back could be on the agenda in my personal personal opinion, but let me know in the comments if you agree. Luke Trainer will be an interesting talent in this year's draft. He has slid down the order a little bit after being considered a top five pick, you know, mid-year. Now, when you when you do mock drafts and you're trying to predict where someone like a trainer would go, you kind of look at teams who might take him and have an interest, and there will be a number of teams that will have 
no need for an intercepting defender with their first selection. Richmond probably falls under the category of a team that could take a Luke Trainer. In my personal opinion, I think they have some degree of need for an intercepting defender. Now he's not a true key position defender and that's worth noting. So by extension, I don't necessarily think they'll need to reach for Luke Trainer. For me, he probably comes into the equation if he's still available at 18, but if they hold one, six, 10 and 11, I probably wouldn't see them taking a Luke Trainer. So we've got eight picks here. How many of those are going to be midfielders? Well, I think if, you know, hypothetically, if they take eight, then I'd probably still cap midfield at maybe four selections, maybe five at a push, but you'd really want to see some diversification with those midfielders. You wouldn't want to pick five of the same type of midfielder. So that will be important. I'm of the belief that Richmond probably needn't take all eight picks to this year's draft. So they've got two options and I think six is probably the minimum. So anywhere between six and eight, it's probably ideal. So there's two main options that they could use to get that down to six. One of them is condensing two picks to move higher. And a lot has been said about say six and 18 for North Melbourne's pick two. Now my personal opinion is that six and 18 is a fair offer to get to pick two in this year's draft considering the evenness. Now I know a number of you might've watched the mock draft that I did earlier this week and I threw in a different trade with a future pick. Richmond fans who didn't like that, I well and truly heard you. But like two days earlier than that, I posted the suggestion of six and 18 and Similarly, North Melbourne fans really didn't like that. However, if I'm in Richmond's shoes, first of all, I still think there's some value in the in the live trade that I suggested in that video, but we're gonna park that. It was a little bit more of a creative twist than an actual prediction anyway. But if I'm Richmond, six and 18 is probably what I'd offer. And I think six and 11 probably exceeds the value of pick two. So we can get into the pros and cons of actually trading up to pick two for a start, but that is one option, trading up two picks to get higher and potentially take the two best midfielders in this year's draft. The other options they have, and they could do this twice instead of trading with North Melbourne, is that they can trade into the future. There are pros and cons of this as well. As for pros, I think there's something to be said for trading assets into the future and spreading out the amount of young talent you have on your list at the same time who are all joining at the same time. And we know teams will come hard for those picks. So I think Essendon, West Coast, and potentially Hawthorne, even North Melbourne with a future pick could come hard for one of Richmond's picks this year. In that scenario, where the, the other team is coming to you, they'll need to provide value. So for instance, you know, a pick say 20, 23, 24, that could genuinely net a future first rounder next year. That is the trend with trading live. It's always expensive to trade live into the present and Richmond could exploit that. There's always risks with that though, particularly next year with an academy compromise draft. You gotta make sure that, you know, trading pick 20 in this year's draft for a future first, you gotta hope that future first doesn't become 26 in next year's draft. I don't know how likely that is and it really depends on which clubs you're dealing with. So for instance, if you're trading with North Melbourne, their future first is definitely probably gonna be in the top five. Hawthorne by comparison, you know, with the compromise nature of it and I'm not sure exactly how to predict Hawthorne's season next year, that comes with a lot more risk. So that will definitely need to be factored in. One other little variable in this is that if I'm not mistaken, looking at, I got this from Bigfooty, so bear it in mind, but Bigfooty has a live like map of where every team's selections are. And if the bloke who made that is correct, seven of Richmond's first eight picks will be considered first round selections. Now I can't find any authority for this. It seems like the AFL kind of make up on the run what's first round and what's not. You can see like on draft night, day one will technically be first round, but we don't know if that includes like compensation picks or priority picks like it's still so unclear but if we assume that the chart that I saw is correct and seven of Richmond's first eight picks are in the first round the impact of that is that that seven of those eight prospects will get three-year contracts to what extent does this come into Richmond's thinking I really don't know because I think you need to be privy to you know their contract situation but I think there is an argument to be made that you don't want contracts extensions and contracts expiries all happening at the same time so again Without being part of, you know, Richmond's list management team, I can't really speculate on that, but I think it will be something that they consider. But anyway, that's a hard one to speculate on, just something to consider. Let's talk about the decision to trade up to get the top two picks. What actually is the temptation to get into that top two? Now we can all speculate and have our own opinions as fans, either for Richmond or otherwise, but it really just matters what Richmond think of this year's draft. And is there a meaningful difference between taking two midfielders at one and two and one and six? My personal opinion, Sam Lawler should be pick one in this year's draft. And if whether Richmond hold one and two or one and six, I think he is the highest upside pick in this year's draft. Let me know in the comments if you agree or disagree with that. But there has been a lot of suggestion that Richmond are really into Sam Lawler, but they're also into Finn O'Sullivan and Jagger Smith and 
Hamilton and Har I nearly said Will Langford <laughs> and Harvey Langford as well. So if we go back to that suggested trade of six and 18 for pick two, we're talking about maybe one of Finn O'Sullivan slash Jagger Smith or Langford and pick 18, assuming that Harvey Langford is still likely to be there at pick six. So do Richmond want to pair two of those midfielders that badly? This is something that you and I can only speculate on and have opinions on, but it really only matters what Richmond think. As a side note, what are the odds that someone like a Jagger Smith is still there at pick six? I think this is a worthy conversation to have, and we're a month out from the draft, and if you think it's locked in, you're wrong. However, bear with me. Say Richmond had picks one and two, and they go Lawler and Finn O'Sullivan. At pick three, you've got Carlton. I think there's a reasonable chance they take Sid Draper instead which leaves Adelaide and Melbourne the two clubs that could take Jagger Smith. Now, Adelaide apparently really fancy Sid Draper, but with their needs probably diversifying their midfield, you could probably argue that they might see someone like a Harvey Langford or a Josh Smiley as more suitable for their team rather than a Jagger Smith. Now, is there a huge difference between Jagger Smith and Sid Draper? I suppose not, but Sid Draper is local and that maybe that's the appeal for them. Anyway, I'm not making a serious point here, but more just doing a thought exercise. Is it possible that Jagger gets to pick six? It seems crazy, but if Carlton overlook him, then Adelaide overlook him. You've got the Melbourne footy club, who, to be honest, in recent times, have really bucked the trend of picking guys you don't, who they're expected to take. They took a big leap on Caleb Windsor last year, took a pretty big leap on Colton Tholstrup as well. And to be fair, the, the Windsor pick looks fantastic, but I wouldn't necessarily lock it in that Melbourne just take the, the bloke that you expect them to take. So in any case, is there a possibility Jagger lasts a pick six? I wouldn't bet on it, but I don't think it's the craziest thing. That being said, it would probably come at the expense of someone like a Harvey Langford. So with that all being said, what, what do we think is an ideal draft haul for Richmond here? And this is where I'd invite you to let me know in the comments what you would do. First of all, how many picks do you want Richmond to take and which players do you think they should target? So if it were me, I'd go Lawler and probably Finn O'Sullivan at pick two. It's hard to differentiate between Smith and O'Sullivan. I mean, they're pretty different players, but I mean, on total ability, I mean, Jagger Smith probably has the lower ceiling, but the lower floor as well. Finn O'Sullivan's a hard one to measure because he just looks like a jet, but this year played through a fair bit of injury, particularly with his hands, and he couldn't quite build up form. And yet he's universally considered you know, in the top two or three of this year's draft, which says a lot about his talent. So if you're asking me, I'd probably go Lula and Finn O'Sullivan. That is assuming a trade gets done with North Melbourne, which I think six and 18 is just above the threshold of being beneficial to Richmond. So when you say things like, do you trade up to get pick two? I don't think it's necessarily a yes or no question. Everyone will have their threshold of price. What's acceptable? Obviously, if North Melbourne come and say straight swap for pick six and two, you do that deal. And then you just work down from there. And for me, I think six and 18 is acceptable for Richmond. Six and 11 is not. So then 10 and 11 become really interesting picks. And while I said I like the idea of Richmond going tall here, at these particular selections, I don't know upon reflection if they really need to reach for talls here, given that they hold a number of selections later in this draft, they're going to be around the range to pick up a number of key talls and they could probably pick two, you know, in the early 20s, late teens. So with that being said, who then goes at pick 10 and 11? Now, at this sort of range of the draft, you have a lot of players that could play midfield but do play another position as well. So I, I like the idea of Trevalia for them. He is differentiated from Lawler and O'Sullivan in terms of his attributes. Not so much a proven inside mid, he's more like a dashing defender who can intercept and, and defend really well as well. But there is upside to play midfield one day and he's got some leg speed and run and carry. So there's an outside benefit there. You've got a balanced midfield in O'Sullivan and explosive inside mid in Lawler. And on talent, I think Travalia in that range does make sense. Another interesting one here is Taj Houghton. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that is the best available player there because the risk with Taj Houghton is he's done an ACL. And I don't think I've seen many mock drafts have Taj Houghton as early as Richmond's pick 11. But he is prodigiously talented. And again, if you're looking for a differentiated skill set, Taj Houghton is different again, a bit more of a forward leaning player who learned to play up the ground and accumulate the footy and be quite an impactful player, but he could start his career as a forward. So if you went Lawler, O'Sullivan, Trevalier and Houghton, I like that personally, but if you don't like that, you've still got some options like Xavier Lindsay or Joe Berry who are differentiated from the guys I just talked about. So we've got three picks left. So we've got 20, 23 and 24, bearing in mind, I've ideally traded 18 to North Melbourne. 
Out of these picks, personally, I think you want to get two talls. This is a good draft to get a couple of talls and then reassess for next year. And with the third pick, I'd probably trade into the future. And I do think, say, on pick 23 on draft night, absolutely, Richmond could net a future first round selection for this, which again, gets them into the first round of next year. Now, to provide balance to that, I did just talk down the possibility of trading into the future first round. It really depends on the team. Because of the compromise nature, that pick could be fairly late. On the other hand, even if it is a little bit later, next year's draft, because it's so academy compromised, you can still combine picks to move further up the draft. So it's hard to say yes or no without knowing who the team is and what the pick is, but I would certainly be holding, say, pick 23 to trade into the future and have an extra first rounder for next year. So with picks, say, 20 and 24, this is where I'd pick one tall forward and one tall back. Honestly, there's a number of options here. If Luke Train is still on the board, he's not a true key back, but probably fits the bill in terms of talent. Other than that, you've got Matt Whitlock, you've got his twin brother, Jack. Could you pair both Whitlock twins at the same club? It would be a nice story anyway. Further than that, you've got Jonty Fall. I'm not too sure if someone like a Job Shanahan will still be available at this pick, but there are still a number of good tall options. So long story short, Richmond front end their midfield, take four medium sized players with their first four selections and differentiate them. And then back end their draft with a couple of talls and trade into the future. Again, you could consider Alex Dodson a project ruck here, but perhaps if I was Richmond, I'd probably prioritize forward and back and look to draft a state level ruck or just simply rookie list one. You know what would be kind of funny? If, if Richmond signed Max Noble, who just got delisted by Fremantle as a delisted free agent, even though they've committed to taking him as a rookie. That would be funny. And Noble's dad played for Richmond. I'm sure Trent Noble played for Richmond and St Kilda. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm going off memory there. So that is more or less the strategy that I would employ, having looked at Richmond's depth, what their needs are as a list. Like I said, it's kind of a blank canvas, but here and there, they've definitely got some prospects, a lot of utilities that I just don't know a lot about. And frankly, that we just haven't seen enough at AFL level. A lot of smaller types as well, but I think this mix, four different style midfielders and two talls trading into the future, getting the top two picks. This is my ideal strategy for Richmond. But of course, let me know in the comments what you agree with and disagree with, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.